1 Corinthians chapter 6. We are going to be looking at something tonight that's very controversial and that most people in our country disagree with us about. So that's a great way to start Bible study, right? We are going to be looking at, uh, let me put it this way, not only would most people in our country disagree with us tonight on probably more than one of the things we're going to be looking at, but probably most religious people in our country is going to be disagreeing with what we're looking at tonight. So that's a great way to begin And we're going to be looking at this, only three verses tonight, verse 9, 10, and 11 of 1 Corinthians. And one of the primary emphasis that I want us to have tonight is on these two words for homosexuality. We're going to be looking at that tonight, going a little bit more in depth at the end of verse 9 here, trying to understand and have a handout to be passed out a little bit later for us. But here at the beginning, we're going to begin with verse 9. And this is the context of what's been happening here at Corinth. We saw last week, we had a great discussion, a great Bible study. We saw last week that there is uh, these lawsuits. And if you look down in verse 8, not only is it bad enough that we have church members basically suing each other over things they ought not to be doing, going before unbelievers, And Paul is like, guys, you're going to judge the world and angels one day. Why can you not figure this out? And why do you go to the unbelievers for? But then in verse 8, he kind of changes some, the gear on us. Verse 8 says, on the contrary, you yourselves wrong and defraud. You do this even to your brethren. So not only are they we might say, quote-unquote, innocent things they're doing, lawsuits, innocent lawsuits, quote-unquote, but they're actually taking advantage of their brothers and sisters in the church. They are being unrighteous. They are acting wickedly. And this goes on with what we just looked at in chapter 5. This is the same church that's got a man having relations with his stepmother, and the church isn't doing anything about it. I mean, it's unbelievable. So... In that context of this book, this unrighteousness happening, an unrighteous man doing that awful sexual thing, and then you have a church that's acting unrighteous, they won't do anything about it, they're proud even of it, and then you have these unrighteous lawsuits going to unbelievers, and then in verse 8 in chapter 6, like we said, then you have this actually purposely taking advantage of people We get down here to verse 9, and we have this great, great warning. It's only three verses. Let's just go ahead and read our verses tonight in our study. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. So let's just jump here in verse 9. Like I said, our main focus is going to be the last two words of verse 9 tonight. But let's start here at the beginning. It says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. And this is one of, and I've talked about it so much, I'm not going to spend long on it tonight. This is one of the things that really gets my blood boiling. Um, Preachers, churches, at funerals, at different settings, people saying that the unrighteous will enter into heaven. Have you ever tried to win someone to the Lord? And um, you've, you've talked to this person privately, you've witnessed to that person, and then unfortunately they die, and you go to their funeral and the preacher says, amazingly, they're in heaven right now. I mean, I've had that experience before. Maybe you have as well. And you're just sitting there and you're just 
What's going on here? This man, as far as I knew, God's the judge, I'm not. The ultimate judge is the Lord. As far as I knew, this man lived in sin. This man cared nothing for God. This man lived any way he wanted to. And now this preacher says he's in heaven somewhere. And it's heartbreaking, not only uh, for the person who's tried to win that person to Christ, but it's heartbreaking because all these sinners are here at the funeral or some other place, and they're all hearing about this man being in heaven, and people are in the congregation, and they're saying to themselves, well, if he made to heaven, I'm going to. Because I made that confession when I was three years old, just like he did, and was baptized. Let me read something to you. I want to show you this is not new. Here it is. Here he glances at certain who maintain what indeed most men assert now, that God being good and kind to man takes not vengeance upon our misdeeds. Let us not then be afraid. That was said by John Chrysostom 1,600 years ago. I think what we see is nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. He 1,600 years ago, He's the most famous preacher of the first 400 years of the church. 1,600 years ago, he's saying to us, most people believe this, that God's not going to take vengeance out on the righteous, on, on the unrighteous. So we see that right here before us. Let's go over these verses 9 and 10. Just look at these sins with me. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators... That's speaking of just general sexual sin. Um, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, obviously speaking of sins of those who are married, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals. Those are the two words we're going to focus on in just a minute. Nor thieves. What do you call a thief? Someone who's supposedly addicted to thievery. What do you call that person? What? A robber, that's exactly, it is a robber. Another word, kleptomaniac, right? Well, that's the Greek word here. It's, it's, that's where that word comes from here in the Greek. This guy is a, a person who is, is a thief, and this is talking about a thief who may sneak into your house and steal. Nor the covetous here, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers. That's someone who... That's a good talker who talks you out of the money. He may not sneak into your house, but he talks you out of the money. And then you have, it says, will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, our focus tonight is going to be on those last two main words of verse 9. In the words that we just read, though, those different sins, ten different sins that were mentioned here, do we have any discussion or questions on these other sins that at least tonight we're not going to focus on? All right. So here's the big question for us tonight. Is In the New American Standard Bible it says effeminate and homosexuals here. What do these two words mean? I've asked Tommy beforehand. If you'll pass this out for us, Tommy, just make sure everyone's got a copy. And this is a just a selection from the booklet that we had at one time in the, in the foyer on homosexuality that I had put out there. And the main thing I want us to see is that the back page and what is in dark print here. What's in dark print? is the main thing that I want us to focus on tonight. But this, in our culture right now, this is a still a big thing, and it's even a big thing within the churches. But the main two questions here is the word effeminate and homosexual. And I want you to listen tonight. I'm going to read to you... Seven different translations that people use today. Just how these last few words in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 are translated. 
The first one I'll read to you is a translation. We have the translation in our Pew Bibles, the New American Standard Bible. And of course it says, nor effeminate nor homosexuals, is what it says. The next translation I'll read to you is the New American Standard Bible 2020. They had an update two years ago. And I'm not a big fan of the update. I don't use the update. The one I preach from is the 1995. And this is what the 2020 says. It just simply says, nor homosexuals. So it just takes some words out or in the English translation puts these Greek words together and just simply has nor homosexuals. The King James Version says, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. And what that's looking at is, I believe, men abusing themselves with other men. That's what the old way of saying it, I guess. The New King James Version translates it, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites. Of course, that's going back to Sodom and Gomorrah. The ESV gives uh, more of a a uh, thought for thought translation if you remember a year or more ago we talked about translations the ESV says nor men who practice homosexuality so it's more of a thought for thought translation and that's fine i like the the new american standard better on there and the new king james though the NIV and this is the 1984 NIV It says, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders. Let me read that again. This is the 1984 NIV. Probably if most of you use the NIV, that's a a fine translation, you probably use the 1984 translation. Which says again, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders. And then the NIV 2011 says this, nor men who have sex with men. So those are the translations that we have here. The big question is, what exactly are these words looking at? What do they mean? What do they point to? I want you to turn to Matthew 11. Matthew chapter 11. The word for effeminate there is used in four places including the verse we read from. And the way the word is in 1 Corinthians 6 is malakoi. If you're interested in what the Greek is, it's malakoi. And in Matthew chapter 11, in verse 8, it is translated twice here in English for us. Matthew 11, verse 8 But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Those who wear soft clothing are in king's palaces. Jesus is speaking of John the Baptist there. Can anyone, does anyone know what words are translated there in verse 8? What words are translated there that come from the same word we're looking at in 1 Corinthians 9? Anybody want to, anybody know? It's the word soft there. That's it. The word soft. But what do you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Those who wear soft clothing are in king's palaces. And then you have in Luke chapter 7, verse 25, Jesus says, But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Those who are splendidly clothed and live in luxury are found in royal palaces. So the word basically means soft that we're looking at here in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. And in the context here, as others have pointed out, it's in the context of sexual sin, it's in the context of idolatry that may have something to do with sexual sin as well. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you've got fornication, you've got adultery, you've got homosexuality right after this word that we're looking at. And the idea there is most people would agree that when the Bible translates this word effeminate, it's looking at the passive partner in homosexuality. That's how most people understand this. Uh, it's someone who, 
who we may say, and I've heard this said, I don't know where the first time I heard it from, someone who may take the traditional female role in a relationship. And um, the dress may go with that, uh, the mannerisms may go with that, but this is looking at someone in this type of uh, relationship, looking at somebody, it appears, most people agree, who's in a homosexual relationship, they are the passive partner in the homosexual relationship. The next word is the big word, really. That's the word we're going to spend more time on. And let me just ask this. this. Have any of you ever gone down, I don't want to say the rabbit hole, but have any of you ever got on the internet, you're reading about this kind of stuff, and you find all these people arguing about what this word that's coming up next here in verse 9 actually means. Have you ever gone down that line before trying to research this? Okay, that's fine. That's good. That's fine. So verse 9, the word that's translated homosexuals here, arsenokoitai, is the word I want you to look at your sheet here on. The Apostle Paul, I would say that most people would say the Apostle Paul is the first person ever to actually use this word that stands behind the word homosexual in our Bible translations. He is the first person to ever use this word. And what I want you to see tonight, if you turn the back of your paper with the, the, the side that has the dark words in bold, I want you to see where almost certainly the Apostle Paul came up with this word from. Let's just start reading where it says the vast majority of English-speaking people. The vast majority of English-speaking people read their Bibles in English. However, the Bible was originally written in Hebrew, Aramaic, Old Testament, and Greek, New Testament. But around the year 100 B.C. or so, the Old Testament was translated into Greek for Greek speakers to be able to read. This Greek translation of the Old Testament was called the Septuagint. Why is this important? Because of how Leviticus 18.22 and 20.13 are translated in that Greek version of the Old Testament. If you're ever reading in your Bible and you see a footnote that says capital X, capital, capital L, capital X, capital X, LXX, that stands for the Septuagint. That's just talking about the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Just like we have an English translation of the Hebrew, Aramaic, and the Greek in our hands right now, well, people in the first century, the apostles even, they had a translation of the Old Testament in Greek from Hebrew and Aramaic into Greek. They read it, other people read it. Greek was the language at that time, just like English right now is the language for us. Remember, the two words arson, mel, and koitai, bed, make up the one word arson and koitai, homosexuals that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Below is the English and Greek versions of Leviticus 18, 22 and 20, 13. Each Greek verse has both of the Greek words in them that make up the word homosexuals in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. In the Greek version, I will bold both of the words in each verse and put their English meaning in brackets. So what you're going to see down here below, you've got Leviticus 18, 22, Leviticus 20, 13. You've got the English there, obviously. That part that's really hard to read is not Greek, but it's transliterated into English. What that means is you take the Greek and you take corresponding English letters for it. Leviticus 18, 22. You shall not lie with man as with woman. It is an abomination, is what the Old Testament says. And if you notice there under that, you see the word for male is arsenos, and then you see the word there for bed, coton. Leviticus 20.13, If a man also lie with man, as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. If you look down in the transliteration of that verse, 
Again, you see these words, one for mel, arsenos, and then for bed, coton. And then at the very bottom of the page, you see it just laid out real easy for you. You see the word there in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and you can easily just read the letters and see how Paul has almost certainly combined the two words, mail and bed, to make this word. Do you have a copy? Oh, you do? Okay. You see how almost it's just, I mean, it's, it's pretty, that's why the vast majority of people who believe the Bible will say this is where Paul got the verse from, or the word from, rather. So what you have here in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 is not some weird thing that Paul's talking about that no one's ever heard about. Paul is going back to the Old Testament. He's putting these words together and he's showing us that this is the same teaching of the Old Testament. Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20. Uh, you can go back to Sodom and Gomorrah. Different places in the Old Testament. You can see this word here is looking at homosexuals here. So if you ever have somebody, a family member, come to you, try to argue about these things, look, none of us have to be experts. We just have to have a little bit of resources, a little bit of knowledge about what's going on. It's right here. Paul is talking about homosexuals, not inheriting the kingdom of God, just like he's talking about thieves, just like he's talking about adultery, just like he's talking about drunkards. He's talking about that as one of the sins that he is dealing with here. Do you have any questions or discussion on that? My assumption is the Supreme Court ruling a few years ago has overseeded all the state laws on that. That's probably what's happened. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Any discussion on what we're looking at tonight so far? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I think one of the big answers is this. It's when a loved one or a family member begin this lifestyle. That's when the pastor's opinion changes on on it. I think you see that over and over in church culture. When, uh, When someone who's very close to somebody changes their opinion on this, well, the pastor or the, the pastors, the deacons, Sunday school teachers, whatever it might be, they're going to try to affirm this person as much as they can and they're going to see that they're going to change their opinion. I think that's one of the big things there. Also, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I also think that um, it's, it's, we are in a time of apostasy in many ways, in the Christian church, um, this is the we're, we're experiencing a falling away in in many in many times in this country. Now, Christianity is flourishing. There's places in this country, churches that are blessed tremendously. So we don't none of, we're none of us are uh, packing our bags going anywhere. I mean, the Lord's building His church. He's building His church in all types of places right now. So let's n- don't ever. Hang your head and think the Lord's not doing anything. I'm not saying anybody is. The Lord's doing great things right now. And we thank the Lord for that. But there is a sense in which the American church is in a time of apostasy. And they are leaving the clear biblical teachings on so many other things. This is one of them, of course. If you turn to Romans 1, just very briefly, this is also the sign of God's judgment. This is a sign of God's judgment on people when sexual perversion is rampant in different forms, whatever that form takes. Um, it's, it's just a sign of the judgment of God on a nation, on a people. You see that here in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, we won't look at it, but verse 18 through 23 is talking about how God has revealed Himself to man and man said, no, I don't want you. They've rejected God. Um, they want to do their own thing. They're going, to, they're going to believe the way they want. They don't need God anymore. They're going to reject God. And when man rejects God, God rejects man. And that's what you see in Romans 1. Verse 24, Therefore God gave them over in the lust of their hearts. This is a judgment. God giving us over. You see that in America right now. God giving people over. 
to, the, to depraved minds, in the lust of their hearts to impurity. Verse 25, for they exchange the truth of God for a lie or the lie. Verse 26, for this reason God gave them over to degrading passions. This is God giving people over. Not because God didn't want them saved, not because God didn't give them truth, but at some point people said, no, I don't want you, I'm rejecting your truth, and God gave them over out of judgment. For this reason God gave them over to degrading passions, for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural, and in the same way also the, ma- the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men committing indecent acts, and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. That's obviously speaking of lesbianism and homosexuality there. Verse 28, And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind. Let's just pause there. This certainly doesn't mean that someone who has fallen into this sin or went into this sin cannot be saved. That's part of what Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians that we're going to see. Everyone can be saved if they come to the Lord. In fact, he says in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, after listing those sins, homosexual, homosexuality, lesbianism, drunkenness, coveting, it's not just all about you know, homosexuality. He says, and such were some of you. There were homosexuals in the church who had been saved out of that lifestyle and now are Christians in the Corinthian church. He said, and such were some of you, but God has saved you. So here what we see, let me read the remainder of verse 28. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. I'm not saying that every person who has gone down this road is in that category because our culture is just feeding it out. It's just feeding it out right now. It's unbelievable what's, what young people have to face right now watching kids' shows. It's unbelievable what children have to do watching children's shows right now. I mean, it is everywhere, everywhere. It's just, it's, it's shocking. Um, our culture certainly, certainly is under judgment, but I'm not saying, I don't think the Bible would teach every single person who has gone down this line to some degree falls in the category of Romans 1. The fact is, there's a lot of confused people, right? There's a lot of confused young people right now. Um, and when you have evil people encouraging people to explore their gender and things, you see some of this stuff taking place. Anybody else? What other discussion we got tonight on 1 Corinthians 6? Those two words we were looking at. Let me give you a quote. This is from A.T. Robertson. This was plain talk to a city like Corinth. It is needed today. It is a solemn roll call of the damned, even if some of their names are on the church roll in Corinth, whether officers or ordinary members. He said, people need to hear this preached and taught. They need warned. And like I said, and I want to emphasize this here in 1 Corinthians, one of the main emphasis is on sexual sin, but it's just as much on heterosexual sin as homosexual sin. That is a huge thing for us to see here. Look back in verse 9. Fornicators, that is just speaking about any type of sexual sin at all. Anybody. Um, Adulterers is speaking about married sins, married vows, so many different things that looks at in the life of people. And listen, he's writing to a church here. He is not writing an evangelistic track. He is writing to a local congregation. He is warning people at the Corinthian church, listen, do you not know people who live unrighteously will not inherit the kingdom of God? It's important for us to see he's not talking about one sin. He's talking about, we may say, sin that characterizes who we are. 
He's not talking about somebody who looks at something on their phone once and they're so broken, they repent, and they just, they're done with it. He's talking about someone who lives like that. That's their whole life. That's what he's looking at. They are this. That's the people who won't be in heaven. And the people we want to see in heaven, we want to see them come and repent and be saved. Well, we go, before we go to verse 11, is there any other discussion here at all on what we're looking at? Yeah, yes, yeah, just a lot of bad consequences. Um, and yet the Lord loves all people. As I know you know, obviously, I'm not saying anything against that. And the Lord just wants everyone to be saved. He wants, to, he wants us to reach out to people. And there may be times we feel like, I just don't know how to reach out to this person. Just a human being, no matter what sin it may be. God wants us to reach and help and try to love and care for the needs of people that we can see them save. I will make a comment. I actually do think that homosexuality is in a category of sins that are worse than... than um, than, than some other sins. Uh, I want to be careful in stressing that too much. The reason I say that is um, all sin is wrong, all sin is bad. So all sin is sin in that sense, absolutely. And yet, if you look in verse 18, this is just talking about sexual sin in general. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. So the Bible seems to be saying there's something about sexual sin in general, whether it's heterosexual or homosexual, that's even against your own body. Something added to that. And then Romans 1 talks about homosexuality as an unnatural sin. You may recall reading that in Romans 1. So all sin is certainly sin in one sense. And yet I do think there's some sins that are worse. Of course, murder is worse than uh, gossip. Gossip can be murder of the heart, but it's at least better than... It's awful, but it's better than murder of the hands. So, yeah, anybody else? And here's the shocking thing. We're looking at these verses tonight that mention sexual sin. And then there's a whole big section coming up about sexual sin as well. Most people would think that Christians are wrong. Most... Even Republicans think Christians are wrong when it comes to same-sex marriage. Can you imagine how many people think it's silly to even talk about something you watch on your phone or on the computer that you don't even participate in with your body? And the Bible says that's wrong too. The Bible says all this is wrong. And it's just how we need help, how we need to live holy lives before God, and how we need to preach this because God knows our hearts. He knows the hearts of the people we are coming in contact with. And the person who gives himself and lives this way, unrepentant, the Bible says they will not enter to heaven. They will not be in heaven. This is something we must proclaim and love to people. Anybody else? You know, you... The church has to be the church. And if the church is the New Testament church, the church gets together, they fellowship, they spend time with each other, they love each other, they have a community. It's not just meeting on Sunday morning and then leaving and never seeing anybody talking. And I know there's different situations. I understand that. The church, when the church is the church, the church is a family. They spend time with each other. And that's when people who have no physical family can find a family in the church. And that's what the Lord wants. But yeah, people are craving approval. They're craving to have somebody love them. How many homes don't have a father? I mean, they just, children want people to love them. If you show them love, it's very probable to some degree that they'll believe anything you tell them after that. That's the facts. Anybody else? Well, look in verse 11. Paul gives this list, and he gives several lists in the New Testament of people. If you're characterized by these sins, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But Paul doesn't stop there, because God doesn't stop there. Such were some of you. The, the, 
the ground at the foot of the cross is level. All of us, to some, in some way, fall into a sin list. All of us. We were all sinners. Such were some of you, he's telling to the Corinthians. But you were washed. Everything you've ever done can be washed away. There may be some here that are concerned about sins of their past. The Bible says those sins in Christ can be washed away, never to be seen again. Clean, clean as snow. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were forgiven, but you were sanctified, you were placed in Christ, and you became holy the moment you became a Christian. You were sanctified. But you were justified. You were declared by God to be in a right relationship with Him. The moment you got saved, that happened. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. Salvation's like an umbrella. you got this umbrella, you pop it open. It's one big umbrella, but it's got all these different things inside of it. Three of the things that happens to us when we get saved is we are washed, happens to every Christian. We are sanctified, happens to every Christian. We are justified, happens to every Christian. And Paul says, hey guys, you used to be like this. Don't be like that anymore. Repent. God has changed you. Leave those sins. You're not those people anymore. Lay them aside. He's also warning people, perhaps, that are unconverted in the church. Hey, you can't live this way and be saved. Repent. This is what God can do to you. And, you know, we talk to people, and this gets back to kind of what we were talking about a little earlier. When we talk to people, we never should hold our heads up high as if we are better than those people. Because we're all deserving of hell. Every last one of us deserves hell apart from Jesus. And yet He has died so we could be saved. Well, is there any... Any discussion, any comments on these three verses tonight or something that's related to these verses? And that's younger and younger. There's one thing probably 10 or 15 years ago. It's a whole other thing right now. Yeah, I think this should be a great reminder for all of us to be careful, not only for ourselves, but those around us. To be extra careful. Anybody else? Amen. We live in a, in many ways, a dark time, of course, in our culture. God's light is brighter than any darkness. God can save anyone and cleanse any sin. Yeah, yeah, yeah.